Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high quality racing oil for your two stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. I'm Tony Blazer and what this video is going to cover is a look back at the 1986 250 class. I'm going to do another one of our shootout reviews where I'm going to take several of the magazines of the time and look at how they reviewed the 250 class offerings of 1986. I love shootouts, huge fan always of the magazines. As you can see I have a lot of magazines back there. I love reading shootouts, always one of my favorite uh, portions of any magazine was uh, looking to see how the, all the different bikes stacked up. Even though back in 1986, uh, you know, I was on a very shoestring budget. I was in high school still. Uh, I couldn't afford any of these 250s, at least when they were new, but I always loved reading about them. And it's kind of fun to look back and see uh, what they thought at the time. Some years, these uh, shootouts are all over the place. It's always struck me as kind of funny that one year you'll have a, you know, one bike will win two of them and then another bike well, I mean, the same bike will finish third in another one. It's kind of weird. Obviously, all this stuff is just people's opinions. Uh, every time I do one of these classic reviews, somebody will say, oh, this bike was great, and even though all the magazines hated it. So I, I get it. Everybody has their own personal opinions on this stuff, and I'm just relying on what the magazines thought at the time. But 86, this is really one of those years where there really wasn't much uh, of a divided opinion. Honda pretty much kicked everybody's butt this year. Spoiler alert, it was a really great year to be riding red. Uh, but this is going to look it back and basically give you an idea of what all the different manufacturers, how they fared in the different shootouts. So below the number one spot, though, there was a little bit of shuffling. Uh, so you like to support the channel. I have Motocross Vault merch available in our my Teespring store. There will be a link in the description below, and I'll put a little card here as well. Just came out with a new Ronnie Titchener design. I had some people ask me for uh, some 125 stuff, so I did one based on uh, the 1991, very colorful 1991 uh, Tough Racing Suzuki that Ronnie Titchener rode. And also did one based on the uh, really cool uh, 1998 FMF 25th anniversary Hondas they ran. I think maybe just Glen Helen. They maybe ran them just one time. They were kind of a throwback to the 70s there in the Marty Smith days with the red pipe, all red bodywork. Those 125s weren't very good. The the 98 through, uh, I guess, 99. I had the 99 125. It was a total turd. When they went to the aluminum frame, they just kind of screwed up the motor. But the bikes looked cool. And these, those FMF Hondas, even though they weren't maybe the best bikes on the track, they looked badass. And uh, I thought this was a cool one to do a version of. So you can find it in my Teespring store. If you could like, subscribe, and share on social media, I would very much appreciate it. If you leave a comment in the section below, I do read them all. Uh, I definitely respond. I love all the interaction everyone gives me. And that's definitely one of the most fun things about having this channel is the great community around it. So here's the story of the 1986 250 class viewed through the eyes of the magazines of the time. The mid-80s were a great time for motocross. Innovation was still moving forward at Quasar speed, and there were still several players making machines in an attempt to gain your hard-earned cash. For a paltry $2,598, you could score a brand new CR250R with work-style cartridge forks, a powerful power valve-equipped motor, and impeccable build quality. Even the worst of these machines would have wiped the floor with the best of their predecessors from only a few years before. Motocross growth was strong, the bikes were good, and the tracks were plentiful. In short, 1986 was a great year to be chasing the motocross dream. At the time, there were still several European players in the 250 class, but their days at the front were already coming to an end. Once powerful brands like Mako and Husqvarna were on the ropes, and even Austria's KTM was far from the powerhouse they are today. Just seeing one of the European machines in the wild was an unlikely occurrence, and only Dirt Bike Magazine deemed them relevant enough to include in their 250 shootout in 1986. In reality, the Japanese had already won that battle by 1986, and all the other magazines treated it as such. Still, I thought it might be fun to include the European machines here to get a feel for what they were actually like at the time. For this retrospective, I'm going to look at what Motocross Action, Dirt Bike Magazine, Dirt Rider, and Cycle News thought of the 86 competition. I'm only going to include their rankings for motocross, although Dirt Bike did rate their usefulness off-road as well. For this one, though, we're just going to stick to the motocross standings. First up on our rundown is the 1986 Honda CR250R. In the overall rankings, Motocross Action rated it first, Dirt Bike Magazine rated it first, Dirt Rider rated it first, and Cycle News also rated it first. A clean sweep for the Red Machine. Put frankly, in 1986, nothing was even close to the CR250R for overall excellence. There were bikes with more power at certain points on the curve, and there were machines with better stability, but none of them were the complete package in the way the Honda was. Its all-new Honda Powerport motor produced a broad, smooth, and very powerful flow of ponies that hooked up and hauled on any surface. Its work-style 43mm Shawa cartridge forks delivered an unparalleled ride that outclassed everything else in the class by a wide margin. 
It turned on a dime, went like stink, and looked like a million bucks. For motocross, its only flaws were its maintenance-intensive power valves, which Honda recommended you service every two hours of use, and the brown trouser-inducing case of shakes it developed when coming down from speed. While these peccadillos held it back from being the perfect motocross weapon, they were not nearly enough to keep it out of the top spot in all of the major magazines' rankings in 1986. Next up in the rankings is the 1986 Yamaha YZ250. In the magazine standings that year, the Yamaha finished second at Motocross Action, it finished second at Dirt Bike Magazine, Dirt Rider rated it third, and Cycle News rated it in second place. After producing a poor handling powerhouse in 1985, Yamaha went back to the drawing board in 1986. The new machine was all new from the ground up and featured revised bodywork, an all new chassis, and some fairly minor mo modifications to the motor. Of all the improvements, the chassis was probably the biggest improvement. The 85 bike had been a poor handler. I had an 85 and it was a just, it was a rocket, but it was all over the track. The handling was terrible in this thing. The bodywork was also very pudgy. Never really cared for the machine. And this 86 redesign really slimmed up the bodywork and made a major improvement in terms of the ergonomics. The revised chassis as well turned much better than 85. That was really one of the major problems in 85. The bike was decently stable, but the turning was terrible. I remember Dirt Bike described it as a school bus with four flat tires, and that pretty much summed it up. Uh, the turning, as I said, was much improved, but it was still not as sharp as the CR in the turns. It was a bullet train at speed, though. Uh, the handling on high speeds was very good. Really where things went wrong was in the suspension department. The Yamaha lacked the sophisticated uh, cartridge forks of the Honda. The non-cartridge KYB forks were harsh in action, and the monocross rear suspension was only mediocre. It did handle decent enough, though, and was fast enough to win in the right hands. In 1985, the YZ had been a loaded mid-monster. It had gobs of torque. was really awesome. I love that engine. And for 86, Yamaha changed the power completely. They went from a loaded mid to a mid-to-top power band. Now, this was not necessarily as easy to ride as the beefy 85 had been. Pros did like the stronger top-end pull, but I think overall most people preferred the 85 motor. Overall, the bike was fast, and it was a much better handling package. But the main thing that held it back was its outdated suspension. If it had come equipped with cartridge forks and a better shock, it may have actually given the Honda run for its money in 86, but as it was, second was the best the Yamaha could eke out. Next up in our rankings, we have the 1986 Kawasaki KX250. Now in the shootout standings, Motocross Action picked the Kawasaki second, a tie with the Yamaha. Dirt Bike Magazine picked it third. Dirt Rider actually liked it a little better. They picked it second. And Cycle News ranked the Kawasaki in third. Like the 86YZ250, the KX250 was a machine with several solid attributes and a few fatal flaws. First among its virtues was its excellent power plant. Using an innovative combination of Honda and Yamaha's power valve technology, Kawasaki's new KIPP system, which stood for the Kawasaki Integrated Power Valve System, provided the KX with one of the most powerful motors in the class. It exploded off the bottom like an open bike and ripped through the middle like a cheetah with his tail on fire. Past that, though, the power fell off a proverbial cliff, but as long as you did not try to rev it out, it was brutally fast and very effective. On the less spectacular side of the equation were the KX's lackluster suspension components. Like the YZ, the Kawasaki relied on a set of non-cartridge Kiaba forks, and in spite of a new travel control valve damping system, they performed no better than the YZ's grim units. The Unitrack shock was just disappointing, and it held back the KX from performing its best in the rough. As with previous Kawasaki's, turning was rather lackluster, but it did offer a much better stability than the Honda or Suzuki. With its tractor-like motor, good stability, and a trick rear disc, the KX was still very well liked by many of the testers. If it had come with better forks, much like the Yamaha, it might have given the CR a run for its money, but with its grim suspension, it was never going to take the top spot. Next up, we have the 1986 Suzuki RM250. In the magazine standings, Motocross Action picked the Suzuki as 4th, Dirt Bike ranked it 5th, Dirt Rider ranked it 4th, and Cycle News ranked it fourth. The 86 season was a rough one if you were a fan of the yellow brand. In spite of an all-new motor, redesigned chassis, and revamped suspension, the RM finished last of the Japanese machines in every major shootout. In the case of Dirt Bikes contest, it even got beat by the KTM, which was no easy feat at that time. The new motor offered a narrow power band and the least overall output of any of the Japanese machines. In spite of the addition of Suzuki's new EVAC power valve, the new motor actually ran worse than the far simpler 85 version had. There was no bottom, a slight pickup in the middle, and a moderate pull on top. It did pull farther than the Torker Kawasaki, but by that point, the KX had already left it in its dust. 
In addition to the asthmatic motor, the 86 RM250 was saddled with outdated and cobby bodywork, cramped ergonomics, a sticky linkage, and subpar forks. After years of dominating the suspension category, even that went to Crapsville in 1986. The newly redesigned eccentric cam full floater was full of stiction, stiffly sprung, and way over damped. Up front, it was the exact opposite, with wimpy springs and too little damping. In the rough, the front sagged and the rear whacked you in the kidney belt. With its stink bug stance, it did turn decently, but high speed action was a handful until you got the thing balanced out. Add in pathetic brakes, poor reliability, and an abysmal level of fit and finish, and it's not hard to see why the arm was the caboose of the Japanese 250 class in 1986. All right, we're up to the first of the European offerings, the 1986 KTM 250 motocross. Of all the major magazines, only Dirt Bike included the KTM in its shootout, and it finished fourth, actually besting the Suzuki in the standings. Now, in 1986, KTM's 250 actually offered one of the most potent power packages in the class. Its low to mid thrust was only matched by the very torquey Kawasaki, and its top end pull was on par with everything but the Rev Happy YZ. It was not quite as smooth as the electric CR, but as long as there was traction, the Katoom had no equal. It was a very excellent power package. Where things went wrong for the KTM, though, was pretty much with everything else. The clutch was grabby, the transmission was notchy, the suspension was poorly set up, the chassis didn't turn, and the brake pads lasted like they were made of paper. With proper setup, it could certainly be competitive with the Japanese, but with its crap clutch, stubborn transmission, and very quote-unquote Euro feel, it was destined to remain a bit player in the U.S. for several more years to come. Next up in the Euro sweepstakes is the 1986 M-Star GM250. Of all the major magazines, only Dirt Bike included the M-Star in 86, and it finished 6th out of 7 bikes tested. Once the purveyor of the best open bikes in motocross, Germany's Mako was nearing the end of the line in 1986. Plagued by financial troubles, corporate infighting, and the stain and cost of several high-profile reliability fiascos, Mako had been forced to file for bankruptcy in 1983. After a corporate restructuring, Mako came back to the U.S. market in 1984 with updated models and a new name, M-Star. Despite their best attempts, no amount of modernizing or rebranding looked to be enough to bring Mako back from the brink. In spite of all this, however, M-Star's bikes looked the part of a contender in 86. With dual disc brakes, liquid cooling, and modern styling, the GM250 appeared to have the credentials to run with the machines from Japan. In truth, however, its underpowered motor, recalcitrant clutch, and odd ergonomics held it back from reaching the front of the pack. The motor, in particular, was a major handicap, being outpowered by even the anemic RM. Dirt Bike remarked that it would have made an excellent Enduro motor, but for motocross, it was too slow to be effective. Other than the mild manner motor, the GM250 was actually a pretty decent motorcycle. Its rear disc gave it an advantage over everyone but Kawasaki and KTM, and its forks and shock were actually rated above several of the Japanese machines. It handled well, and actually turned better than the Kawasaki, and offered better stability than the Honda. If not for its trail bike power plant and sky-high price of $3,200, which was roughly 25% more than any of the Japanese machines, they might have been in the running to upset at least Suzuki, but as it was, it was too pricey, too slow, and too niche to make it into the motocross mainstream in 86. Last up in our 1986 250 motocross rundown is the Husqvarna 250 motocross. Again, only Dirt Bike tested the Husqvarna in its shootout, and it ranked it last out of all the machines in 7th place. Much like Mako, Husqvarna was struggling to keep up with the Japanese in 1986. Their off-road machines remained competitive, but their motocross offerings lagged well behind the best machines in the class. Old-school ergonomics, stodgy handling, and lackluster power plants made the Swedes a hard sell to a generation of Americans groomed on the cut-and-thrust pace of Supercross. For 86, Husqvarna dialed up some minor refinements to their 85 package, but it was not nearly enough to bring in the Husky up to snuff with the Japanese. New porting and a revised exhaust pipe boosted the mid-range slightly, but the Huska still continued to offer one of the least potent power packages available. Low-end torque was better than the gutless RM, but it was worse than everyone else. Top-end power was totally non-existent, and trying to rev it out only made more noise and less speed. In the mid-range, there was a little burp of thrust, but it was over as fast as it got started. In addition to an underwhelming motor, the Husqvarna offered a set of harsh and flexy 40mm forks. This at a time when all the Japanese had moved on to much stronger 43mm sliders a skyscraper seat height, and an utter aversion to turning. On the plus side were its styling, which was very handsome, its shock, which was a high dollar Olin's unit that actually worked pretty well, the stability, which was excellent, and the overall build quality of the machine. Unfortunately, however, none of these virtues were nearly enough to stave off the competition, though. This 86 Husqvarna was certainly a cool machine, and important in that it's one of the last 
Husqvarna is ever to actually be built by the Swedes. But in 86, if you're looking for a top performer, this was probably not the best machine to buy. So there you have it. That's a look back at the 250 class of 1986. A class full of some interesting machines, brands like Husqvarna. They were kind of on their last legs as a Swedish enterprise. A year after this, they would be sold to Kajiva, an Italian brand. And although the brand still, the, the name still exists, of course, the current Husqvarna is really just a white KTM. Uh, they would be, go be Italian bikes, and then BMW got them. And anyway, long story, they've gone through many um, iterations. Mako, this is really kind of the death knell for the brand. I think they came out with like a 500 or something in the mid-90s, but I don't, I, I honestly, I've never seen one. As far as a uh, kind of a powerhouse in motocross, Mako's days were in the rear view mirror. They'd gone through a bankruptcy in the early um, early 80s there, and we're really having a tough time. Uh, as they rebranded M-Star, it never really, you know, they never really came back to any great extent. So, 86 is interesting, you know, kind of a, you see the Japanese are all ascending in the 80s, and the Europeans are all in the downturn. KTM, thankfully, would come back. they go bankrupt in, I think, 91, and you see today, KTM's one of the most dominant brands in motocross. So, it's pretty cool how those things happen. They go up and down. Of course, the winds of change are always moving, and uh, definitely motocross things move really quickly. So there's always <laughs> whoever whoever's on top this year is uh, you know a dog the next. So I love that about it. It's unpredictable. So if you like this sort of thing, make sure again you share, subscribe, comment, all the normal stuff. I certainly would appreciate it. it. Helps get the word out on the channel, help grow it, and I certainly appreciate all the support. And until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.